Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are watching, listening from. Welcome to Zoom with ZOA. I'm Steve Feldman. I'm executive director of the Greater Philadelphia Chapter, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you all to an important webinar about Jerusalem in danger. Uh, we have a lot to talk about this afternoon. This is a, a very hot issue. Uh, but again, welcome to this Zoom with ZOA. I hope everybody watching uh, is well and your loved ones are well. I wanna welcome our local leadership from the Greater Philadelphia Chapter and National ZOA leadership who are with us today. I also wanna thank my colleagues, Alan Jay and Jackie Schaefer who are helping out on the back end. I also wanna say hello to my colleagues who are uh, watching also. Welcome everybody to uh, the event. I wanna remind everybody before we really get underway that COA is a nonpartisan organization. If you use the chat, please keep things polite and, uh, and, and it's not an opportunity or form for, for partisan uh, comments. So please uh, respect the topic, respect the organization and our participants. We will uh, hopefully take questions and have time for them at the end. There is a Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Please put questions there. We will not be monitoring the chat for questions. If you have a question for our panelists, keep it on the topic and put it in the Q&A area. Also, um, I want to thank two individuals who are sponsoring this event today. They each asked to be anonymous, but we thank them for their generosity. Uh, and now I want to get to the meat of the program. Uh, if you uh, knew that you were about to be burglarized to have your home violated and some of your most precious possessions stolen, you would do everything possible to try to prevent it and thwart such a burg burglary. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jewish people uh, may be uh, about to be burglarized. Uh, as the United States is pressing to open a consulate in Jerusalem to serve the Palestinian Arabs. Um, and uh, the fact that we know that this is uh, underway and being threatened uh, gives us an opportunity to do what we can about it. There's a lot to learn uh, about this topic and some activism uh, to help try to prevent it and to guide us uh, and give us insight into this subject matter. We really have a panel of three experts. So I wanna introduce them to you now. Professor of Law, Eugene Kantorovich at the Scalia. He is, also, he is at the Scalia uh, Law School at George Mason University, where he is director of the uh, school's Center for the Middle East and International Law. He really is one of the preeminent experts in international law. Uh, is always in demand and really is gifted for his ability to clearly articulate complex issues and concepts. Also joining us this afternoon is Morton Klein, the national president of ZOA, who is really one of the world's preeminent Zionist and pro-Israel advocates. He was recently reelected as national president of ZOA and his passion and boldness for these matters are inspirations to activists throughout the world. Uh, also joining us this afternoon is Dan Aluz. Dan is an international law expert and an attorney. Also, he is a former Jerusalem city councilman and he is ZOA's representative in Israel and therefore a colleague of mine. Welcome to uh, this event, our panelists. Eugene, I wanna start with you. Uh, please give our audience a little bit of background. Why is this an issue? There's a uh, US embassy now in Jerusalem uh, you would think that a, a consulate in the same city would be a little superfluous, to put it mildly. Give us some background, first of all, for our audience. Uh, so it's important to understand that the consulate plan is designed to partially turn back the clock on U.S. recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital without fully or formally doing so. So some history. Um, the U.S. did open a consulate, did have a consulate in Jerusalem, which was opened in 1844. Needless to say, that was not a consulate to the state of Israel. 
It was not a consulate to the Palestinians. No one had heard of Israel or the Palestinians. Uh, it was a consulate to the Ottoman Empire designed to pr principally serve American uh, travelers, pilgrims uh, in, um, in Jerusalem. The, that consulate um, first came under Jordanian control. And because America did not recognize Jordan's um, annexation of Jerusalem, it uh, main, did not, the consulate was not accredited to Jordan um, from 1948 to 1967 when Jordan occupied parts of Jerusalem. After those areas came under Israeli control in 1967, America did not accredit the consulate to Israel and continued to run it as a separate consulate to Jerusalem, not to any particular uh, unrecognized, unrec not recognizing any country's sovereignty of Jerusalem, not because America did not recognize Israel's um, acquisition or uh, liberation, whatever you want to call it, of territory in Eastern Jerusalem in 1967, but because America had never recognized any part of Jerusalem as being under Israeli sovereignty. Uh, the United States position since 1948, as, as has many other countries, has been, has been that none of Jerusalem is anywhere in the country of Israel. It's a silly position. It's not a reality-based position. It just shows you how hard old peace plans die. It is, um, some kind, it is paying some kind of lip service to the continued validity of the 1946-47 UN partition proposal, which suggested that Jerusalem become an international city. Uh, nothing ever came of that, but nonetheless, the United States did not recognize Jerusalem as being in the country of Israel. Uh, so the consulate was not accredited to, uh, to Israel. The big issue, the, the consulate was just a symptom of the non-recognition of Jerusalem as being in Israel. Now, a bipartisan, uh, overwhelming bipartisan majority of Congress uh, in 1995 said enough of the facade, Jerusalem is in Israel, uh, Israel is the un unif undivided capital of Jerusalem, and time to move the embassy there. That embassy, uh, that the law was only eventually implemented after many presidents said they would but didn't, by Donald Trump um, in 2019. So the Jerusalem is now recognized officially by the United States as what, of course, everyone has always known it is in Israel, the capital of Israel, and uh, the embassy was moved there. When the embassy was moved there, then the question is, what do you need the consulate for? Uh, you don't need the consulate. Those services can be performed in the embassy. But also, it's never the case that you have a consulate in the same city that you have a country's embassy to that country. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Consulates are supposed to serve a separate consulate district. Uh, and most importantly, the consul general didn't report to the ambassador, right? To the, no, now, normally in international law and diplomacy, the ambassador of a country called the sending country, the country that sends the ambassador, is the head of all of the diplomats of the sending country in the receiving country. Uh, he is the top honcho for any of his country's officials in the receiving country. But the Jerusalem consul had his, was, was not subordinate to the ambassador. Uh, and that made sense within the illogical, uh, within the illogical um, context of American position, policy. That is to say, within the illogical position that Jerusalem is not in Israel, if it's not in Israel, then it's logical for the consul general in Jerusalem not to report to the ambassador to Israel, because it's not in Israel. Right? He was not going to report to the ambassador to, to France, because it's not in France either. Right. So, but when we said, but once America said that Jerusalem's in Israel, the function of the consul stopped making any sense. Because if Jerusalem's in Israel, the consul general has to report, and then it becomes subordinate to the to the embassy. It's a very important sign that uh, when the um, when the uh, State Department is talking about um, opening up this new consulate, they intend for the consul general again not to be subordinate to the ambassador, but to report directly to the State Department. That is a clear wink and a nod. Why is the consul? Why is a consul in Israel? not reporting to the ambassador to Israel. It's a clear wink and a nod that this, in fact, is uh, not really part of Israel, not fully part of Israel. There's some question mark over it. Professor, More more, go on, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I was yeah. going to ask you, what is, what is international law? What is US law? What are, what are the customs, international customs with regard to embassies and consulates? Uh, yeah, the key aspect of um, 
international law is that uh, you cannot open an embassy or a consulate in another country's territory without the permission. So for America to open this consulate will require Israel's permission. And that's why they're so frustrated because they're not getting it. Uh, and, and so there's no, just so our audience knows, there's no way around that. Israel can refuse to allow this to open uh, if it so chooses the Israeli government, correct? If the Israeli government, well, there, there is a way around. That is to say, uh, it's a halfway around. It's, uh, international law says the host government can consent. And it, see, it must consent. But it seems that the State Department's position is that they can force them to consent. So the State Department intends to get the consent of Israel, but they intend not to get the free consent of Israel, but the coerced consent of Israel. Interesting. Given, uh, given the state of things, if, if this were to happen, this, this consulate to open in the same city of Jerusalem where the embassy is, mm -hmm. what kind of precedent would this set for other countries to, uh, to possibly do likewise, would it? So Israel has, since 1948, not allowed other countries to um, open uh, separate missions to the Palestinians in Jerusalem, because it sends the message that the Palestinian, that Jerusalem belongs to the Palestinian Authority and Israel, both, that it's some kind of joint possession. They both have a claim. Uh, and so Israel has not allowed that in the past. Once they allow it for the United States, of course, every European country is gonna say, hey, we want a consulate to the Palestinians also. Certainly no country is going to be able to, since America opened an embassy in Jerusalem, several other countries have opened embassies and diplomatic offices in Jerusalem to Israel. Now every country that opens an embassy or a diplomatic office to Israel in Jerusalem, to, in Jerusalem is going to have to open a separate Palestinian mission also, because America, which invented the embassy in Israel, right, or pioneered the idea, if they're doing it, how is anyone going to be more pro-Israel than America? And then you're going to have a line of represent missions to the Palestinians in Jerusalem. Jerusalem becomes the embassy row of Ramallah, and then try saying the Palestinians don't have a share in Jerusalem. And, and this really jeopardizes dividing the city again, uh, as it was pre-67. And, and given uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2334 uh, and other international uh, attempts to declare uh, so-called Eastern Jerusalem as uh, a part of a Palestinian state, God forbid. Uh, what does this mean for, for the holiest sites to the Jewish people uh, in all the world? Are they in jeopardy? I mean, first of all, it doesn't, it's, this is not a division of Jerusalem, it's worse. It's calling into question Israeli sovereignty over all of Jerusalem. But certainly, and in, certainly over those parts, including the Kotel and, uh, and, the, and the Temple Mount. They would be in jeopardy, uh, correct? Everything, everything would be in jeopardy. And, and it could. Could if Jews lose east or west Jerusalem? It's worse. It's all of Jerusalem. So could Jews lose access to to the Temple Mount, to the Kotel, to not as an immediate result of the consulate opening? It's a entire. It's a you know far from that, but certainly it would weaken Israel's claims to sovereignty in all of Jerusalem. It would not result in anything immediate. It would be a, a diplomatic setback. And, and why would this be in Jerusalem? Why is the United States government pushing this to be in Jerusalem as opposed to, let's say, Ramallah? Because Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. I, like I said, they would like to undo the recognition, but the recognition has bipartisan support. At the same time, their progressive wing, Ilan Omar, is demanding the opening of this consulate. Mm -hmm. So they want to make the progressives happy and uh, sort of half reverse the recognition. But that's already, a, you know, that's a big deal. Half of Jerusalem is a big deal. I want to turn now to uh, Mort Klein, ZOA's national president. Uh, Mort, uh, I want to uh, take off from something where uh, Eugene just said, uh, which is why, why, in your opinion, is the, is the Biden administration pushing this consulate now? Why are they pushing it for today in Jerusalem? As the professor uh, said, who, by the way, I recommend highly his outstanding article in the Wall Street Journal last week on this issue. <clears throat> <clears throat> this is the first step in dividing Jerusalem, and this is the first step in reversing Trump's uh, saying that the U.S. now will fulfill the U.S. law of 1995, <laughs> that Jerusalem is the undivided capital of Israel. In other words, by opening the consulate, it really is dividing Jerusalem, which is against U.S. law. <laughs> They're doing this to respect 
a phony claim that the Palestinian Arabs have a right to parts or, or maybe even all of Jerusalem is what their claim is. Because <laughs> uh, obviously if you wanna really have a consulate to perform the function of the consulate, you open it in Ramallah. It's quite clear. In fact, the prime minister Mohammed Steyer of the Palestinian Authority said openly, this is the beginning of dividing Jerusalem. He said it himself. This is undermining Israel's sovereignty in Jerusalem. The Biden administration <laughs> made a promise to Muslims in, when he spoke to the Million Muslim Vote Summit, <laughs> where Linda Sarsour, the vicious anti-Semite, Ilan Omar, and uh, the Congresswoman Ilan Omar, another anti-Semite in Congress, Salam al Mariadi, the head of MPAC, Muslim Public Affairs Committee, who's, who's stated publicly Israel shouldn't even exist, he stood next to them and spoke to many thousands of Muslims and said, I will move the, M the consulate to Jerusalem. He made a promise to them. He didn't make it to the American people. He made it to the Muslims. And yet Biden says to Be Prime Minister Bennett, I made a campaign promise. So you have to, you can't uh, stop me from fulfilling my campaign promise. Well, it's not Israel's fault if he made a promise. And by the way, he only made it to the Muslims. <laughs> and so the only reason they're doing this is simply to undermine Israel's claim to Jerusalem and to be the first step to give at least parts of Jerusalem as, uh, 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 as the capital of the Palestinian Authority. And they're opening this in Western Jerusalem, not even the Eastern part. It's in the Western part of Jerusalem, which is uh, unequivocally uh, 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 Israel's. And what's worse, by doing this act, you have the Palestinian Authority who's promoting terrorism, who's paying Arabs to murder Jews, who's refusing to negotiate, who's naming school streets, sports teams, and children's camps after Jew killers, uh, who uh, 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 Abbas uh, 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 executes anyone who sells land in Judea and Samaria to a Jew. All these horrible things are happening. So why are we opening up a consulate in Western Jerusalem? It is really rewarding these horrible actions and policies by Palestinian Authority. We're saying you're doing all these horrible things and it's okay. We're gonna give you a consulate in Jerusalem. And by the way, America or Israel is getting nothing in return. It's not like if you do this, you've got to do A, B, and C. They're doing this unilaterally. Uh, the Palestinian Authority is, doesn't, is not agreeing to doing anything in return for this outrageous uh, uh, action that, the, uh, that uh, America is, is, is now uh, moving for, toward. <laughs> And as the professor said, this can't be done without Israel's permission under international law, the Vienna Convention. <coughs> uh, Naftali Bennett should have said, it's no, no ifs, ands, or buts. Instead, unfortunately, he said, let's have a committee to look into this. He never should have done this. He should have said, there's nothing to talk about. You're not uh, opening a consulate there. And then America couldn't do this. And of course, they can still do this. In fact, uh, Barkat, the former, uh, M.K. Barkat, the former, Mayor of Jerusalem uh, has a law which he's trying to get passed in Israel to make it illegal uh, for Israel to allow uh, a foreign consulate uh, in, in the city of Jerusalem. It has overwhelming support. We hope that'll pass. Uh, and now because of what Biden's doing, uh, and zeo has been uh, acting involved with Senator uh, Hagerty of Tennessee, uh, who's put together a bill that has 36 signatories. Unfortunately, it's all rep only Republicans uh, making it illegal for Biden to move this consulate to Jerusalem. Do we have 36 signatories already? That's and S3063. I just want to give the number out. S3063. Mm -hmm. uh, if your senators are not already uh, co-sponsor, please urge them to co-sponsor. And those who have co-sponsored, please thank them. I'm sorry to interrupt, Mort. I just want to give the number out. And also, Lee Zeldin has a letter with 200 signatories of the House of Representatives Again, only Republicans. That's a painful fact that I have to say that. <laughs> also, a, a letter urging Biden not to do this. So we urge, as you just urged, uh, tell your members of the House and Senate, if they're not on this letter and this bill, to get on this letter and this bill. If they are on it, thank them profusely for it. You also should be telling your rabbis in the synagogues to make speeches about this, make this an issue, uh, and, and tell your members of Congress to take a serious public stand on this write op-eds about it, write letters to the editor about it, uh, write to Jewish leaders, write to the heads of APAC and ADL and B'nai B'rith. They have not publicly come out 
uh, opposing this publicly. The Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations has not publicly come out opposing this. Write to them, tell them how important it is <laughs> that uh, uh, this be prevented from happening. And in fact, it's interesting that President Biden in 1995 <laughs> said the only way we can get to peace is that there is no daylight between the US positions on issues and the Israeli positions on issues. Well, here's a chance for him to fulfill his own uh, uh, theme, his own thesis, and do not go against Israel's will and, and pressure them to allow the moving of this embassy, uh, uh, of this consulate uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, we're, we're give, is, our, give our audience an, an idea <laughs> with, with the passion that, that only you really have how urgent this issue is to the Jewish people. <laughs> this is a critically urgent issue. It is the beginning of losing sovereignty over Jerusalem for Israel and for the Jewish people. It's the beginning of the Palestinian Authority having a greater claim to say we want parts or all of Jerusalem as our, as our capital. By the way, they always say we want Jerusalem as our capital. They don't say uh, just Eastern Jerusalem. They always say Jerusalem. <laughs> it's a serious issue. And this should not be controversial. People on the right and the left agree that Jerusalem should not be undivided. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> this is really very important that we all get active on this issue. ZOA, uh, uh, we have this uh, webinar with distinguished guests. Uh, we've done action alerts. We've written op-eds published about this issue. Uh, in Israel, we spent a tremendous amount of money having huge banners from very large buildings saying, say no to a, a Jerusalem consulate for the Palestinian regime. Uh, we have our own people in, in Israel speaking to members of Knesset to not allow this to happen. This is a very serious issue. This is an issue where we need to fight for the future of maintaining an undivided Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish state of Israel. It's that critical. Thank you, Mort. Dan, I want to turn to you. Uh, possibly uh, nobody knows Jerusalem, uh, at least uh, with us tonight uh, and today, better than you. You were former Jerusalem City Councilman, in fact. Uh, what are your thoughts about what a Palestinian Arab consulate anywhere in Jerusalem would do to the character and the sanctity of that city? Well, thank you, Steve. Uh... I, uh, I first of all will start by saying that I fully agree with everything that was said by Mort and Eugene. Uh, and so I'm gonna build on what they said. Uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, what they said, uh, but rather I'll build on what they said in order to give a more uh, local uh, perspective uh, as in uh, what, what it does to managing a city, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and so first of all, when you're speaking about a city council and, and, a, and managing a city, foreign intervention is always a bad thing. Uh, whenever you have foreign intervention, it usually interferes with what the city wants to do for itself. In Jerusalem, you have a ton of foreign intervention. You have the Turks that try to interfere in Jerusalem. You have UNRWA, you have the Jordanians. And now you also have friends of ours, uh, the US that wanna intervene and try to tell us what to do in Jerusalem. Uh, and so that's already a bad thing for the city council and for how we can manage the city. Uh, in the specific case of the consulate, uh, it's even a worse uh, thing, because as Mort uh, said in the things he said, uh, the Palestinian Authority that is supposed to get this consulate is not a moderate uh, body. The Palestinian Authority is an authority which pays salaries uh, to uh, Jew killers, uh, names streets after terrorists, uh, denies the Holocaust up until today. And today in Jerusalem, the Palestinian Authority already has a very strong influence, unfortunately. Uh, you should know that there's schools in Jerusalem that are run by the Palestinian Authority. Uh, if it was up to me, I would just close these schools because this, they incite for hatred, they incite for terror. Uh, they're horrible schools and I would just close them. Uh, the Jerusalem municipality right now, what it does is that it tries to compete with these schools. They open Israeli schools next, next to those schools run by the Palestinian Authority, uh, and they try to, uh, to convince Arabs to send their children to the Israeli schools uh, in order to get a more moderate education and a better education when it comes to uh, other subjects. Uh, I think it's a bad policy, but even when you think about this policy, uh, having a win to the Palestinian Authority inside of Jerusalem would just strengthen the PA, would just encourage 
Arabs to send their kids to those inside, inciting schools and would make the PA schools stronger. And the schools is only one of the, uh, the examples of the influence of the PA that, uh, in Jerusalem. It would make the PA stronger. Uh, other than that, there's also obviously the, the, the question of the division of Jerusalem, which both Eugene and Mort alluded to. Uh, if, if we're speaking about a united Jerusalem that as a city council, we know how to manage a united city, when we're already st starting to speak about a, a city which is meant to be divided, uh, again, that's obviously not my position, but it's what the Americans would be signaling, uh, then as a city council, it's very hard to manage the city because when you try to invest in the eastern parts of Jerusalem, the whole world starts condemning you and saying, how can you be investing in a place that's not yours? When you don't invest there, then the, the whole world starts condemning you and saying, how are the roads so horrible in Eastern Jerusalem? Uh, how are you not taking care of the Palestinians? And so it's a catch 22 that they're putting us in. And if it does end up leading to the division of Jerusalem, then that's obviously a very, very tough situation for Jerusalem. It would make many, many of the areas uh, that are very central to Jerusalem, even the, the, the center of the city of Jerusalem, uh, very close to what would be the border. Uh, Again, I really hope we don't get there, but it would make these uh, very close to where would be the border and impossible to manage the way that they are today. It used to be that sniper, Jordanian snipers would uh, shoot at passerbys in these very areas. If we go back to these days, then it would be a very, very tough situation for Jerusalem. Uh, Dan, I want you to get out your crystal ball or your tea leaves, whatever you use, and uh, give our audience some indication of what you think the Israeli government might do. There is a the slimmest uh, majority of a coalition. I think they've got 61 seats out of the 120 member Knesset. So it's razor thin majority uh, with a very broad spectrum of parties in there. What is the government uh, led by Prime Minister Bennett, Foreign Minister Lapid? What are they liable to do with this situation? So we have a very interesting government in Israel right now. Uh, it's a very tough government to manage. It has, on the one hand, extreme left uh, parties and Arab parties that unfortunately support terrorism. Uh, and on the other hand, it has some parties which are right wing in ideology. Uh, and so it's a very, very weird government and very diverse. Uh, it's clear that one part of this government wants the consulate to be open and the other really does not want it, see, sees it as a red line. In the middle, you also have someone like Lapid, which says openly that he doesn't want to consulate, but that his reasoning is, I don't want to consulate because it gives me political trouble. Not because he has any real problem with it, but just because it gives him political trouble. And this whole coalition is only 61 people. It's a very slim majority, 61 out of 120 members of the Now, there is a big event which is happening this week, and it's that this coalition is going to try to pass a budget this week. Uh, by the end of this week, it should have passed a budget if everything goes to their plan. And if they pass a budget, what happens is that it's much harder uh, to break down this coalition because the only real way to break down this coalition if they pass a budget uh, would be to have 61 people not only disagree with this government and vote it out of office, but it would have to also crown a new king and choose another prime minister that would replace Naftali Bennett. And so they would all have to agree on someone else, probably Netanyahu, but we have a problem uh, with Netanyahu not having 61 people, even uh, if this current coalition doesn't, uh, doesn't work, he doesn't have 61 people uh, supporting him. And so that's not a real alternative. And so after this, the budget passes, the whole crisis of whether this coalition will survive or not is going to pretty much go away for a little while. And then the question is, what happens then? When American pressure starts growing, because we, uh, we know, and the Americans also said it in closed conversations that they're waiting for this budget to pass in order to put much more pressure on the Israeli government. Uh, and so the question is, when the American pressure gets much higher, uh, who in this coalition will have the decisive uh, voice? It's possible that as long as Naftali Bennett is prime minister, he'll be able uh, to stop uh, the consulate from opening. But Naftali Bennett also has a rotation agreement with, uh, with Yair Lapid, who is to become prime minister in, around, in less than two years. Uh, and when he becomes prime minister, 
Is he also going to stop this consulate from opening when he's saying even now that the reasons why he's not he doesn't want it to open is only because of political internal political reasons and not because of ideological reasons? That's unclear. And I'm also unsure about Naftali Bennett. I really hope that he stays strong and that he doesn't bow down to pressure, but he's never been tested when it comes to American pressure. And so the question is, is he is even Naftali Bennett going to be strong enough to deal with pressure both at home and his coalition, even though the breaking up of the coalition isn't very relevant, and also with the American pressure coming from outside, will he be strong enough to stand? I hope he will be. Right now, he is saying that he will stay strong, but he has to prove it uh, uh, when time comes. Uh, Dan, let me ask you this. Is the members of Knesset, particularly uh, members of the coalition, are they vulnerable to pressure from diaspora Jewry either way to to prevent this consulate or to accede to uh, U.S. government demands? Is there any uh, are, they, are they moved by by opinion of diaspora Jewry either way? I think they are very moved by the opinion of diaspora the jury, not necessarily because they're prone to pressure, but because they they, they feel much stronger when they know that they have people supporting them and supporting the right positions uh, in America. Uh, they like that also in the Jewish community, of course, but in America in general uh, also. Uh, many times the picture we get in Israel is that America is very critical of Israel, uh, that the American Jewish community is also very critical of Israel and is very critical uh, also of Israel taking the right decisions, to be honest. Uh, and between us in this closed conversation, maybe I can also say that they're often right. We have a lot of people criticizing Israel in the Jewish community in America, unfortunately. Uh, and But that just makes it even more important for those of us who do support Israel and who do support uh, the right positions when it comes to Israel uh, to speak up uh, and to let them know that there's also a different voice and that they have people that will fight uh, for Israel and to make sure that when it takes the right decisions that they'll that they'll have room to take these, these right decisions and, and that they'll have these soldiers here in America. Uh, and so I think that it's very important. That's the reason why ZOA took these big banners uh, that Mort uh, spoke about in order for Israelis, we took them in Israel, right? And the reason is for us, uh, for Israelis to also know, MKs and also Israelis, to also know that there are Americans that will stand uh, by Israel when it takes the right decision. Excellent, excellent. We're gonna take some questions from the audience, but before we do that, just a couple of brief announcements. This afternoon, you've heard about some of the challenges that our community faces, uh, and you've heard what ZOA is doing. We're having this webinar. We've got this campaign going in Israel against the consulate, and we will be uh, leading more efforts uh, in the near and distant future, as long as this issue is with us. You can help us not only meet these challenges, but really, uh, meet these challenges proactively in addition to reacting by supporting the Zionist Organization of America and the work that we do. Please donate to our organization. If you are in the greater Philadelphia area, please support the greater Philadelphia chapter. If you are uh, anywhere else in the country uh, or where there are other chapters, please support those chapters or national ZOA. I'm gonna give out the, uh, the websites for those in the Philadelphia area, the, in, the website is philly, P-H-I-L-L-Y dot Z-O-A dot org. That's philly dot Z-O-A dot org. For National Z-O-A, the website is Z-O-A dot org. Very easy to remember. If you want to reach us here in Philadelphia, the email is office at Z-O-A philly dot org, office at Z-O-A philly dot org. And if you're outside of the Philadelphia area, want to reach out to National ZOA, the email address is info at zoa.org. Also very easy to remember. Please support our organization locally, nationally. Your donations are the fuel that really allows us to do the work that we do, the vital work that ZOA does. Now, uh, some questions. Question primarily for Professor Katarovich, but our other guests can certainly add to the conversation. Professor, uh, up until the embassy was moved by President Trump, there was a consulate in Jerusalem that was serving the Palestinian Arabs. Uh, why would this be any different this time? Were things to go sort of to the status quo ante? Yeah, exactly. Well, it would be different for three reasons. 
but uh, I think you use the word the status quo ante. The status quo ante was um, the United States didn't recognize Jerusalem as being in Israel. So that is the status quo ante to which they right. want to return. Uh, it was not a, that was not a good thing. Um, and uh, it was decades of work and a huge diplomatic accomplishment for Israel to overcome that. Mm. But it would be even worse because again, the consulate in Israel, Israel sort of inherited from the Jordanians and the British and the Ottoman. Israel never permitted that consulate to open and serve the Palestinians. That consulate was never accredited to Israel. So it was just kind of there. This time, Israel itself has to give permission for a consulate to the Palestinians. And then that will, setting up the strongest argument, well, even Israel agrees that the Palestinians have a share in the city. Um, the So first of all, Israel did not approve of the former consulate. Israel has to approve this time. Uh, the former consulate was not explicitly aimed at serving the Palestinians or certainly not having diplomatic relations with them. Again, it was opened in 1844. Uh, this consulate is specifically being billed and explained as a place to conduct diplomatic relations with Palestinians. So it will function even more as a de facto embassy to the Palestinians in Jerusalem than the um, uh, than, um than the pre, uh, than the previous one, so those are some significant differences. And uh, yeah, I mean, you could say we're only going back to before America recognized Israel as being in Jerusalem, but uh, that's a big deal. I might add, this is Mort Klein. Uh, Ambassador Nides on this issue has made a false statement that there's been a consulate for the Arabs there since 1844. In fact, as the professor pointed out. This was not for the Arabs. This was for Americans who would come there. In fact, the Christian Zionists were active in this constant in 1844 as a way to encourage Jews uh, to move to Israel, to make Aliyah to Israel. That was one of the reasons this was opened up in 1844. And uh, also a consulate there would be an, an, an additional problem. When there was a consulate there before in Jerusalem, they would tell visiting officials not to go to Jewish areas in Judea and Samaria, explaining various lies why they shouldn't, and only to go to Arab areas in Judea, Judea and Samaria. We can't have that. We can't have this phony propaganda being given credibility by a consulate in, in Western Jerusalem. And we really shouldn't be surprised, by the way, by uh, uh, President Biden doing this. The 20 or so people he's appointed that affect Israel, every one of them, is hostile to Israel. Not a single one is, is pro-Israel. Every one of them is hostile. Even Blinken uh, has spoken at J Street conferences, has praised Linda Sarsour, uh, is against sanctions on Iran. Uh, and I can go down the list. So we shouldn't be su surprised about this. Uh, he's under enormous uh, pressure, Biden, uh, to do uh, what the people hostile to Israel want him to do. And that's one of the reasons this is happening. Not to mention, uh, people on the Hill have told me that Obama is very active in this administration and really uh, uh, making sure that he, the people he wants appointed to positions are being appointed, and they are, and, uh, and that his positions are being uh, the ones that are promoted, uh, not positions that maybe Biden, if he was not uh, mentally compromised, uh, would be uh, otherwise promoting. Dan Luz, uh, question for you. Where can people find email addresses for members of the coalition government to write them to uh, press to make sure that they keep this uh, consulate from opening? So there is a Knesset website in English. Uh, I suggest that while you ask the next question, I'll look for it and post it in the chat for everyone. Does okay. that sound good? Absolutely. There was a question about where people can find out the uh, senators who've co-sponsored uh, S3063. If you go to a wonderful website called congress.gov, it's everything you want to know about the United States Congress. There's a search. If you search for Jerusalem or search for S3063, you'll see the bill. Once you get there, you can click to see who the co-sponsors are. As Ward said, there's, uh, I think, about 36 at this point. As for the House letter by Congressman that was initiated by Congressman Zeldin of New York, if you go to his website, if you go to house.gov, you can see a list of House members of Congressman Zeldin, and he has the letter posted on his website. You can see all of the House members who've signed, uh, and there's at least 200 who've signed that. 
so again, you should urge those lawmakers who are not on these measures to please join them. And those who are already on them, it's very important to thank them. It, we, we really need to show gratitude uh, in addition to asking people to do things when they do the ask, uh, it's important to thank them. Uh, <laughs> next question we have, Dan, do you have those uh, email addresses? Dan, I guess you're muted. I'm putting them up as we speak. Okay, good, thank yeah. you. There is a, a question here, uh, I guess, uh, Professor Kondorovich, you can take up the first crack at this. Please clarify the difference between the former consulates on Nablus Road versus Agron Street. Uh, which one opened in 1944? When was the other opened, if you, if you know? 1844. I don't recall the dates. I believe the one in uh, on Sheikh, uh, no, I believe the one in Agron was actually the first. But I, I, I don't recall the dates. Okay. There were branches of the same office, basically. I see. Uh, Mort uh, and, and Dan and also Professor, all three of you, uh, we're talking about Israel. We're talking about Jerusalem. Uh, and, and this really should not be, good, I, I would say, as just a Israel issue. It really is uh, at the heart of the Jewish people uh, because of what Jerusalem represents to us, the sanctity of, of the city. <laughs> Uh, the fact that it's vote, some of vote can only be done there, etc. Uh, many people watching remember the joy when the eastern half of Jerusalem was liberated in the uh, six, day, six day war in 67. Please uh, discuss that this really is a, not a political issue, it really strikes at the heart of the Jewish people. Well, let me say it's more. <laughs> First of all, we should all be promoting the truth about Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem is at, at most mildly holy or important to, to, to Arabs. The word Jerusalem never appears in, the, in their Holy Quran, not a single time. When they controlled Eastern Jerusalem, which is the real Jerusalem, from 40 to 67, they allowed it to become a slum. They put slum houses up against the west, Western Wall. Uh, no Arab leader but King Hussein visited Jerusalem when they controlled it for 19 years. If it's so holy to them, why didn't all the... Uh, Arab leaders, Muslim leaders come to Jerusalem regularly, because this is a lie. It is not holy to Muslims. They simply want to take our holy city, our heart and soul away from us to uh, really have us let, have less of an attachment to Israel. <laughs> so th this is uh, critical for uh, all those uh, different reasons. And I also wanted to say we should, in context of why is Biden doing this, Biden has become the most hostile president to Israel ever. He's, he's now giving aid to the Palestinian Authority, even though uh, we have laws that while they're paying Arabs to murder Jews, they can't give aid, and yet he's doing it. He has publicly condemned Israel for building within the existing boundaries of Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. Uh, and if you add up all the communities in Judea and Samaria, you're talking about maybe 3% of all of, the, of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. So Israel is really in a very tiny portion of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. Uh, so we see a whole range of hostile positions this government has taken. This is only the most recent one and one of the most dangerous. I, I, can, I can answer by saying my personal story. Uh, I was born and raised in Montreal, Canada, praying three times a day, uh, facing Jerusalem uh, and, uh, and praying for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And then I decided to move uh, to Jerusalem uh, and establish my family here. Uh, Jerusalem was important to me before I became Israeli. Uh, it was important to me because I was a Jew. And of course, the building of Jerusalem is a Jewish issue, not only an Israeli issue, it's something that should affect every single Jew all around the world. Uh, and so I completely agree with what you said, Steve. Thanks. Uh, Professor <laughs> Kantorovich, uh, what role other than uh, the legislation introduced by Senator Haggerty uh, wants to limit funding or cut off funding if this consulate opens so it's not funded. Is there any other role aside from the, the purse, the power of the purse that Congress has with regard to the issue of uh, the U.S. opening a consulate in Jerusalem to serve the Palestinian Arabs? There's other things uh, Congress can do to slow things down, but uh, the power of the purse is, 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 is primary. Um, but uh, I think the pressure needs to be put on the administration as well, not just Congress. 
And one reason the administration thinks they have smooth sailing here is because the major Jewish groups have not told it otherwise. So even though the Jerusalem is a consensus issue, a bipartisan issue, this is not a BB issue, Lapid is against it, uh, Gideon Sar is against it, Bennett's against it. I know people even in the Labour Party are against it. The Jerusalem is a consensus issue. It's what the American Jewish group said they've been waiting for 12 years of Bibi, something, an issue that is unifying and not Bibi. And they're completely silent on it. And that's what tells the administration that they have a green light <laughs> for it. And uh, you know, also not also effective in addition to writing your senators is writing to your to your Jewish groups and asking them where they stand on turning back <laughs> to the administration. So this, this is important. I'm sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> Jerusalem, as the professor just pointed out, is such a consensus issue mm -hmm. that when Americans for Peace, Peace Now, the far left wing group hostile to Israel, wanted to become a member of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, the conference said, we will not consider a vote to bring you in unless you change your policy uh, about dividing Jerusalem. They had to publicly say, we oppose dividing Jerusalem, we're in favor of a divided Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Only then would the conference say, we will allow you to be part of our conference. That's how much of a consensus issue uh, it was, and hopefully it still is. Uh, and Dan, back to your expertise there on the ground as a, as a former uh, member of city council, at least in Jerusalem, are the politicians from, you know, maybe you've heard some scuttlebutt, are the politicians in the coalition, uh, nervous that this could bring down the coalition? Is is Benny Gantz, is uh, Naftali Bennett, are they nervous that if this really moves forward after the budget is passed and the and the coalition survives that if they do, are they are they nervous about this, do you think? I mean, they say it outright, Gary Lapid said it outright, that he's very nervous that this issue uh, might break down the coalition. Uh, if, if this issue is put forward aggressively by the Americans, then the right flank of the government will probably keep on opposing it, while the left flank will uh, support it. Uh, I'm talking about the far left, not even Yair Lapid, uh, but even I'm talking about merits and far right, uh, far left parties. Sorry, uh, they will probably support the American move because they want Jerusalem divided, uh, and so it will create a lot of tension inside of the government that will be very hard to manage. If it happens before the budget passes, which seems that it won't happen because the budget should pass to this week, uh, then we will definitely lead to the to the uh, end of this government. If it happens afterwards, it will create a real crisis. I don't know to say if it will be the end of the government or not, uh, but it will create a real crisis. Lapid is afraid that his government will fall because it means he won't be prime minister in another two years. Uh, so he has personal vested interest in this, uh, but, uh, but he says it outright. Uh, and I just want to uh, get from Mort and the professor again, the, the American Jewish community and even our Christian friends, uh, Kufi, other groups, Friends of Israel, we really have a role to play. And, and really, this is the time now for people who may have been on the sidelines to get involved because of what is at stake at the at the grassroots level, at the national level, at the at the local level. Is that is that correct, gentlemen? More than <laughs> it's very important for people to ask their rabbis, their local federations, their JCRCs, and write to the major groups, APAC, ADL, AJ Committee, B'nai B'rith, Orthodox Union, National Council of Young Israel, all of the Jewish groups urging the leaders to publicly say no to opening up a consulate in, in Western Jerusalem for the terrorist dictatorship of the Palestinian Arab regime. It's very important and it will have an impact. Thank you. Uh, before we close, I just want to remind people to please support the Zionist Organization of America. There is no organization that is doing what we are doing with the passion, with the boldness, with the effectiveness. So please support us. If you live in the greater Philadelphia area, please support our chapter or the chapters in the Detroit area, Pittsburgh, Florida, and National ZOA, please. It's vitally important. The information to make donations uh, are in the chat, I believe. Uh, so please do support us. I wanna thank our guests. I wanna let people know that we have an event tomorrow. 
uh, a book uh, event, a book club with Liz Burney. Can, uh, can one of my colleagues please post the information in the chat? It's very important that you watch that. <laughs> event. Please get in, got involved in activism and advocacy now more than ever. I want to thank our esteemed panelists, Morton Klein, Professor Eugene Kantorovich, Dana Luz. Again, I want to thank my colleagues. This has been recorded. It will be available on YouTube on our channel there uh, in a day or two. Thank you all very much. Please take this matter seriously uh, and be well. And thank you for joining us. People can call their congressmen or senators by calling one number, 202-224-3121. 202-224-3121 and ask for your senator, ask for your member of Congress, and you can reach that person. Leave a message with the staffer who answers or a message on the machine. The members of the House and Senate take a list uh, of all the messages as to what people are saying to them. So these calls, even if you leave a message, are very important. You have the number, you can reach every senator and congressman with that one number. Do it, it can make a difference. Thank you all, have a good day.